Jim here. Thanks for joining. As promised, I clipped up a bit that uh, long scuba gases video that I made, and today I've concentrated on the narcosis section. So all about narcosis, how nitrogen conspires with evil, evil carbon dioxide to come together for something that's not so nice. Uh, you learn all the ins and outs of narcosis, how to deal with it, how to plan around it, and here it comes. Nitrogen. Here are the stats. Now, nitrogen potency you, set, you see is set to one because that's how they set the scale uh, kind of artificially. And so nitrogen narcosis, right? Um, this is interesting, right? A lot of things in scuba, the mechanism is not well understood. And as a scientist or kind of a, a pseudoscientist, that interests me. So for example, it's not really well understood why nitrogen uh, makes us drunk, why, why we get nitrogen narcosis at depth. They think it's, you know, obviously it seems to be related to solubility, but there are a lot of things they don't understand. They don't understand, you know, exactly why we have um, oxygen toxicity, the, the, the uh, CNS toxicity. They don't know why. Why does the bends hurt? Uh, you know, being bent. They, they're re there's a lot of things with scuba that they really don't understand. I find that fascinating. Um, now, here's the thing. So CO2 and oxygen. Here we're going to start seeing how evil CO2 is. So it started, it started with how soluble CO2 is in fat. And now you're seeing CO2 is actually a trigger, a compounding trigger for uh, narcosis, which if you, if you read a lot of accidents and incidents, there are an awful lot of them that um, have narcosis as, as one of the causes. And oxygen's a trigger. That's really inconvenient, right? So there are a couple different theories of, of why nitrogen narcosis happens. If you're a, a chemistry geek like me, here they are. Uh, so we manage, especially as technical divers, not, not so much as recreational divers, but technical divers will manage uh, their equivalent nitrogen depth, um, right? So their, their partial pressure of nitrogen to keep the equivalent nitrogen depth at 40 meters or less, right? So if there's a gas mix that they're breathing where the amount of nitrogen in it would seem like 50 meters of narcotic effect, they would say, ah, no, we have to back off the nitrogen until it's the equivalent of 40 meters. And that's beyond this course. But just to put you in perspective, what technical divers, what kinds of things they're, they're grappling with. All right, decompression uh, illness, DCS, DCI, I will cause it DCI. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but interesting. Um, you know, a lot of the symptoms of a lot of these things look like other things. But if you want to see more about uh, DCS, DCI, I, there's another video I have about calling Dan Japan or Dan USA. And if, if you happen to be thinking if any of these things are something you're experiencing, please call Dan, Dan Japan, right? But uh, interesting things here. So extreme fatigue, right? Uh, difficulty thinking clearly, headache, dizziness. A lot of these things are very much like other things like oxygen toxicity or, you know, narcosis. I mean, it's, it's kind of incredible. But of course, this is after the dive usually, right? So you wouldn't be having nitrogen narcosis after a dive. You wouldn't be having probably, I guess, oxygen toxicity after, right? That, that effect would very soon go away. Other nitrogen issues. Now, here's where we're gonna to start to get into uh, sort of deep, deep air again. So um, nitrogen's a big molecule in air. It's, it's not only the highest percentage, right? 79, 78, 79%, but it's also a large molecule. And uh, has and because of that, it, it it's not so nice when it gets dense, right? So high pressure increases the density and uh, the resistance. So um, at really deep depths, nitrogen can get dense enough that your work of breathing, something very important to rebreather divers, right? The system um, they don't want to have a system that has a high level of work or work of breathing because that will create carbon dioxide that creates work, a, a stress on your system. So nitrogen, when it gets beyond a certain density, starts to increase your work of breathing and becomes, makes your body produce more CO2 because you're working harder just to breathe. Um, it has a lot of turbulence, which does the same thing. And because of that, as I hinted, it, uh, in, it contributes to increased CO2 buildup at depth. Not a nice thing. So, so you have nitrogen 
at depth, which is causing narcosis. And we've already saw, we've already seen that CO2 contributes with nitrogen to narcosis. So you have a really bad situation brewing. So that's the implication. Right, so I think I've mentioned narcosis already here and there, and uh, since we're speaking of nitrogen, let's talk about narcosis. So what are the signs and symptoms of narcosis, uh, including but not limited to euphoria? Right, it's like being drunk. Uh, those of you who know it, know it. And uh, short-term memory loss, ringing ears, or some sort of auditory change or hallucination. Uh, numb, tingling lips, difficulty reading gauges, numb, tingling limbs, and etc. So there, there are a lot of divers, especially new-ish divers, that say, "Oh, you know, I don't, I don't feel narcosis." And uh, generally, people are going to feel it from anywhere as early as 18 to 20 meters. Um, I think, I think scientifically, people are experiencing it from about 20 meters, possibly a little bit less. However, they might not detect it, but most people start to detect it, maybe in the mid 20s, late 20 meters. Or, you know, somewhere around 100 feet, 100 feet plus, and then they really start feeling it later on. Now, uh, my experience, folks who are relatively new generally don't experience a lot of sensations underwater. For example, uh, open water students, I'll be freezing my, my butt off teaching an open water class, and the students are, are just fine. Narcosis is the same way. Even an advanced student who's a, a newish advanced student might not be feeling be in touch with uh, their narcosis. Personally, my personal tells are ears and lips for me. My signs, ears and lips. I feel my, my lips start to feel numb and buzzy and warm. And my ears, I, I start to notice that my, my bubbles, ding, 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 ding. it changes from a bubble sound into a tinkling bell sound is what it turns into. And that's how I know I'm experiencing narcosis. So aggravating factors, things that make narcosis worse. Cold, CO2 amplifies it and even changes the character. Uh, fast descent can accentuate fatigue, anxiety. <laughs> so your mental state can affect it. Poor visibility, some medications actually. So there are a lot of potential factors to make narcosis worse. Yeah, so CO2 though, for me, is the most important one. So working hard during a dive, working hard before a dive, uh, you know, stuck in a current, uh, CO2 is gonna amplify narcosis, and from what I've heard, it even makes it, changes the character of narcosis, more panicked, more shortness of breath. It becomes an even darker shade of narcosis. So CO2 is, is a nasty, nasty uh, complication. Navigating narcosis, how can we mitigate? How can we get around it? So I guess if you are really worried about narcosis, you could alter your gas, go to a helium gas. You know, if you're, if you're going with a deep dive and you're thinking, am I gonna be deep air or helium? And you look at the depth and what you're doing, uh, maybe you could go with a different gas or dive plan to a different depth, something more shallow. If you had some sort of a thing you wanted to see or accomplish, maybe it could be done at a shallower depth. What I do is I consider my task complexity and loading and its exertion. So if, if I know I'm gonna be, for example, for me around 35 to 40 meters, and if I'm thinking, for example, let's say I'm on a rec dive, you know, more in my younger days, I'm going on a rec dive and I think, all right, uh, I'm going to be in a rec dive. I'm going to be laying some line. I'm going to be tying some kinds of knots. I'm, it might be uh, a complicated navigation, or may maybe if I'm going to have to go through a current, I'm probably going to think about, wow, if I'm going to be at 40 meters doing this on, on an air-based or nitrox-based uh, gas, no helium, I might not opt to do this. I might pass on this because I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to be narked and these are the tasks I have to do. I don't know if I'd be up for that. I'd have to look at the risk of not being able to accomplish those tasks. If the risk is high, <laughs> I'd better abort the dive before I even start or change the plan, reduce the complexity, reduce the exertion, et cetera. Yeah, here, here's the example. And I've been in this situation actually. A complex navigation would be another situation. Again, maybe in a wreck situation or maybe not. I, I can't think of an example right now other than a wreck or, or a cave, but 
uh, you, you certainly, I certainly would not want to be in a situation where my navigation, my life depended on my navigation and I might be experiencing some severe narcosis. That'd be a bad situation for me. I, I don't think I'd put myself in that situation. Another way to combat it, training for that dive. If you have some time to train for a big, a big dive event that's coming up, overlearn the skills if there is skill or task complexity, overlearn it. Make it as automatic as possible so you're not actually having to think too much while you're narked to do the task. Also, uh, having things maybe pre-calculated, pre-written down, or being able to write things down, allowing your, your dive notes or your slate to be your brain instead of your brain, because your brain will be limited in this case. That is another strategy. Uh, narcosis adaptation. Does it happen? Are you able to get used to depth? Are you able to resist, build up some tolerance, just like tolerance to alcohol? Can you build up tolerance to the narcotic effect? I think yes. When I was a young man and I was diving a lot, uh, every weekend, 30 to 40 meters, multiple dives, I noticed that it was not affecting me as much. That was my personal thought. And to add to that fact, so this Brent Gilliam, uh, in, in the late 80s was, you know, doing a lot of dives, uh, deep air. Yeah, he, he was diving down to 400 plus feet. So, and he trained up to that. So worked down to that depth of 600 dives over the course of a year. So that person definitely feels like they built up some tolerance to the narcotic effect. However, uh, many researchers believe that um, it might not be a physical ad adaptation. It might be more of, of a uh, mental adaptation, um, feeling less, less anxiety and uh, more performance, automaticity with your tasks. Because I've definitely noticed that people who are, have a high anxiety level will be more apt to be narked. So in addition, the adaptation, if that's what it is, is short-lived, they say. Um, it goes away after five to seven dive, uh, days without deep dives, which makes me think that it is actually an adaptation because probably your task automaticity would last more than seven days. So I'm thinking that this is this is getting some tolerance to the uh, to the narcosis. Uh, right, it's bad. <laughs> deep nitrogen is bad. CO two. Um, highly soluble, as we saw, it's the most soluble. 25 times more soluble than nitrogen. Triggers oxygen toxicity and nitrogen narcosis. How much more evil could you get, right? I mean, seriously, th this is the perfect villain in a diving story, you know, uh, CO2. I'm, I'm gonna really make the case for CO2 as, as something that you, you should be managing. I manage my dives around CO2. It is my primary, one of, one of the primary, of course, it's not the only concern, but if I had to narrow things down to one, I'd probably be thinking CO2, right? When getting to my dive, how much work I get walking to my dive or climbing or I have to climb down or do something strenuous before the dive or after the dive, during my dive, you know, what kind of current am I, how hard am I going to have to work? I have anything heavy, or currents, you know, what, what is it, what's going on? Um, yeah, CO2 management is super, super important. CO2 is damn evil. Right, hypercapnia, uh, high levels of CO two, is uh, is a serious killer. If you if you're a fan of of dive books like I am, if you read back, you know the old uh, pioneers of deep diving and deco diving and cave diving, you know uh, wreck diving, you know all those early pioneers who are deep air divers. I love those books, and you know I, I respect the the shoulders of of those of those heroes. But a lot of them died, you know, some pretty unpleasant deaths and mostly because of deep air and a combination of nitrogen narcosis and co2 poisoning or co2 narcosis so you know it's uh yeah i'd like to just add to this carbon dioxide slide going back to some of the the days that the books i've read about about deep diving i think they might have been like sheck exley books i really don't remember but you know hearing about the terrible things that, that happened to people on these deep dives like I remember one where there was this uh, like deep diving platforms where a platform, a bunch of divers on a platform just goes down somewhere in Mexico, the Caribbean, I forget, just goes down to some deep depth and feeling the effects and, and doing whatever. And apparently like people almost blacking out from CO2 and going off like a robot. 
just swimming off into nothingness or swimming into rocks, just keep swimming. Their brain is kind of gone. They're kind of in a zombie mode, uh, just like this CO2 narcotic blackout almost. And uh, so, yeah, some terrible, terrible stuff, CO2 and nitrogen together. Who knows which one it was more than nitrogen or the CO2, but yeah, just...